Thank you for coming. My name is Michal Stanek. I work for a company called Semihap. Okay. I'm going to talk about some security additions which we have been working on at FinFreeBNP, mostly regarding to the boot process, but also some other things. Uh, most of the work which we, which we have done is already available in FinBNP head, so we can all use it. The plan for, for the presentation consists of roughly three parts. In the first part, I will explain Secure Boot, especially with regards to uh, the UEFI implementation of Secure Boot. This is something which uh, we wanted to have in the, the our customer wanted to have in their systems. Uh, along with uh, FreeBSD very exec, which is uh, another security layer which we wanted to use, uh, originally implemented uh, by Juniper, by SJG from Juniper. So I'll be talking about how we integrated the ring with the QEFI to suit our systems. And uh, the third part will be about trusted platform modules, so TPMs. I'll explain what they are, what they're used for, what are the possible use cases, what are the use cases which, use cases which we considered and used. Uh, one of them being the, the, the most common one being the measured boot. And uh, as, a, as one of the most interesting use cases uh, for us, uh, I'll explain how to use uh, StrongSwan IPsec VPN implementation uh, hardened with the TPM. So in effect, the TPM does the signing uh, in hardened in this dedicated uh, separate hardware instead of the, the CPU. So three parts. Let's start with uh, Secure Boot, Secure Boot 101. Uh, what is the purpose of Secure Boot? Basically, the purpose uh, is to only allow authenticated firmware and OS and uh, other elements to run. So each element in the boot process, each image, has to be uh, has to be verified. And only if it's successfully verified, it will be allowed to run if Secure Boot is enabled. So it's a kind of a defense against rootkits and uh, malware, uh, which cannot be persist persistent on a secure root machine, hopefully. Uh, so uh, if uh, the attacker supplies some kind of rootkit, so modifies any boot image, like the bootloader uh, or loader or, or any part, uh, on next boot, uh, this will not have a very valid signature, so it will not uh, just it will not execute. The secure boot forms a chain of, chain of trust it's called a chain of trust, starting with something called the root of trust, which is the first element, the first software which runs, runs in the machine. And uh, the idea is that each, each uh, image, uh, before it passes execution to the next image, and then the next boot, next stage boot loader, it has to verify it first. So it uses signatures, uh, database of X509 signatures uh, that are allowed, and it verifies the signature, and only if it passes will it uh, pass execution to the next stage. Otherwise, it will fail. So each image verifies the next one. Uh, so the, the first, this first root image is called uh, root of trust. And obviously, it is not verified by anything. It has to start somewhere. So this first image has to be immutable. It's very important that it's implemented in uh, read-only memory. So uh, there is a hardware-based enforcement that this software cannot be modified. So it uh, usually is just burnt in by the vendor, and it's not uh, not ever updated. So it, uh, the attacker cannot modify this one. So if, uh, if you can only really attack it in the, in the root of trust. However, each, each next image is verified, so you cannot get in there and uh, implement, implement some malicious software. So this is an example of such a chain, starting with the reset, you have something called usually called a boot ROM, which is this first small piece of software it runs. Uh, and another thing is that for verification, we need to have a reference public key, which we are going to verify with. Verify with. And this also is, is very important that it's protected from modification, because otherwise the attacker would supply their own public key, and the verification then of the malicious software would, would succeed. So uh, very often, uh, technologies like one-time programmable memory or EPUs are used for that. So you have a burned-in uh, public key, which cannot be modified, and uh, it's at a, a fixed location. So it will, be, it will be the reference for all these uh, verification at each, each and every step. 
So uh, just a quick reminder of how, how verifying and signing works uh, in the public key cryptography. So you have a message, you hash it with the cryptographic hash. Cryptographic hash. Uh, the signer has access to the private key. And uh, whether you're using RSA or DSA, you're using a signature algorithm on this hash. And you end up with a digital signature, which is applied with the message, bundle it with the message, message somehow. I'll, I'll be talking about how it's uh, done in UEFI. You have a science message, so again, here we can be a piece of firmware with a signature. And in order to verify it, to verify it, you have to have access to this public key. Uh, for verification, uh, you separate it into message and signature. You hash it the same way with the same algorithm, like SHA256, uh, which is usually used in UEFI. And then you use the public key with the signature algorithm for verification, and you, you either pass or fail. So how is it implemented in UEFI? Uh, for better or worse, uh, UEFI uses the Microsoft's PE COP format for, for its binaries, uh, which is known. And uh, PK, there's something called PKCS7. Uh, it's a format for signatures which can be bundled uh, with those binaries. So you have a binary, which is a piece of firmware, and the signature is there uh, bundled in the according to this format. Uh, OpenSSL is one of the few libraries which uh, supports this format. So the, the common uh, UEFI implementation, which is EDK2, it is compiled with OpenSSL, and uh, that's, that's how it can uh, verify. So here's just an example. Uh, this is a binary format. And uh, you have a pointer in the image data directory entry number five, pointer to the certificate table. And then you have uh, on the left side on the bottom, you have a list of the, the whole chain of certificates because you, because you can you can just like in TLS, you can have chain certificate as well. Uh, something very important uh, in security in UA5 are the databases of allowed uh, certificates and also uh, blacklisted certificates. So I'll just very quickly explain. Without going into too much detail, uh, you know, terminology, uh, what are the like the main critical uh, environmental variables? Because uh, the databases are stored as uh, environmental variables in UEFI. Uh, so, so DB and DBX are the, the whitelisted and blacklisted certificates, right? So DB is a da database of certificates which are allowed, and DBX are the forbidden ones. Uh, outside of, uh, apart from certificates, you can also use direct hashes. So the DB and DBX can also, uh, apart from certificates, store direct hashes which are allowed or not allowed. So hashes of some firmware or any image. Uh, so first you check with DBX uh, if there's, uh, if, if what you're trying to verify is blacklisted. Uh, you check its hash if it's there. And then you don't have to deal with certificates because it's more direct. Otherwise, you have to deal with certificates and do the whole verification. Uh, so uh, there's a kind of key hierarchy in UEFI, and the, the one at the top is called platform key. You might be familiar with it if you saw um, these options in the UEFI uh, bootloader. You can change your PK, change your TK. So the PK is at the top, and it's uh, it's owned by the platform owner, and it's not supposed to be updated very often. Uh, it is allowed with some of it access to the PK private key can uh, do any modification to any of these variables. So it's the highest level of privilege. However, mostly use the key exchange keys, uh, and the key exchange keys. Uh, if you want to modify them, add a new one or delete one or modify, you have to sign this operation this update operation with PK. Uh, very often uh, on, on modern platforms, there's a, you might have seen the Microsoft's PK, PK which is uh, usually uh, just by default in there, but uh, hopefully if your machine is not, your machine is not locked down, you can have your, your own one. Uh, and if, again, if you, if you want to update anything in DB or DBX, you have to sign with either key K, any key K in the list, or K. 
And as I said, you can, uh, apart from certificates, you can uh, do just hashes, which is less convenient. Uh, but uh, if you don't update your firmware very often, you can, you can do that instead. It's a valid use case. So that's uh, very quickly how the algorithm works for verification. You have the image first, the first is the image which you're trying to verify. The first you just uh, just check for the hashes. Uh, so check the blacklist. If uh, there is a match with the blacklist, you immediately fail because it's just not allowed. You can revoke uh, bad firmware that way, firmware with vulnerabilities. Otherwise, uh, you check in DB, and if you have a match with DB, that means it's whitelisted and you just succeed. You don't have to deal with certificates. There's a, there's a valid uh, hash in DB. Otherwise, you do with certificates, so we check if we trust the signer. If not, then we fail again, DB and DBX. And then we do the whole verification uh, if, if we have a match with DB. So if there's a match, we succeed. Uh, so this was about UEFI. Uh, however, there was this is a very exit layer which we wanted to use. So at first we wanted to um, just be able to verify the kernel, the BBC kernel, <coughs> make sure it's uh, it is trusted. However, uh, we saw this uh, very exit thing, which was I think uh, originally in NetBSD, and we saw that we can not only verify the kernel, so the loader can be able to verify the kernel and the module's authenticity, but also we can verify parts of user space. So very exit verified execution is a layer where you can uh, you have a list of uh, files, file paths, doesn't have to be binaries, and they're hashes. And again, you have whitelisted uh, lists of hashes in binaries, and uh, the kernel itself will not allow uh, opening or executing uh, such a binary or file if it's not in the list, if its hash is not in the list. Uh, so as I said, it was created by Juniper for Dunos. Uh, we cooperated with, with uh, Simon from Juniper to, uh, so that we have a common library uh, for using that. Whether you're using a system with UEFI or not. Juniper, uh, originally, they are not using UEFI. I think our uh, implementation with UEFI, if, you're, if you want to use UEFI, it's kind of simpler to use because you have access to these databases and easily revoke. Uh, so we're really happy with how it works. And since February 2019, all of the very exact implementation is, uh, is in QBSD head. Uh, this reference file for verification is called the manifest in the very exec. And this is uh, this list of uh, files and their hashes, which are allowed. The, the idea for very exec is uh, just to prevent executing any malicious or untrusted binaries, uh, kernel, or script. So it's uh, very well suited for embedded systems, for example, where uh, you, you're not modifying much. Maybe you have a static uh, read-only uh, file system. So it's an additional level of, of protection that even the root user will not be allowed to execute uh, untrusted uh, files. So there are basically hooks at certain system calls, <coughs> like identity uh, or open, uh, the, the main ones. And uh, of course, it introduces some overhead. So the kernel has to, before it allows the open or the exact path, has to do the verification. You can uh, cache these uh, these hashes so you only verify once, and then prevents further modification. Uh, so it, it introduces, introduces some overhead, but. Uh, uh, I think it's a pretty good trade-off uh, that you know, this kernel enforced uh, verification. Uh, I've already said that the manifest contains just simply paths and, and hashes and also some flags because you have to differentiate between like a simple binary which you directly execute or maybe it's a script for an interpreter. So it gets quite complicated. Uh, we, the, the kernel then builds this uh, database of, of uh, uh, these paths, which are the key, and then the hashes. And each time the file is loaded or is trying to be executed, you search for, it ha for its hash. If there's no match, you just fail the the, uh, the operation. So there are certain different levels which you can configure very easily with. Uh, the lowest one is just that there, there will be a warning 
if there's a mismatch. Um, the, the higher security levels are that uh, this will just fail the operation. It's a bit more complicated than that, but it's, uh, I think it's all in the, uh, in the man page. Uh, so now, if we are using uh, UEFI and very exit, we have this manifest which is not part of the trust chain, and it's uh, very important for security because this is our reference. And we do not want an attacker to be able to supply their own manifest because that would uh, just uh, fill our security and they would just plant their own hashes. So we do have to verify it somehow. And uh, we, we saw that you can, we can uh, use these trust anchors from UEFI for this, which is really, really convenient. Uh, so the manifest file is usually at a fixed location, and uh, in a separate file in the same location is its signature. Uh, so in essence, we are doing what we did before. We, we have access from the loader to the DB and DBX and all the other variables, because the UEFI exports it with a <coughs> get variable uh, runtime system call. So it's, uh, it's very easy to do. So we uh, retrieve the, the databases, and we uh, use that as reference for the verification. Uh, one problem which we have to resolve is uh, we needed those uh, crypto APIs. We, need, we needed to have crypto in the loader and in the kernel later on to be able to verify. And uh, it, it wasn't really, of course, the loader is a uh, we want it to be small, we want it to be lightweight, we don't want to pack open SSL in it. Uh, so uh, then we, we found something called Bear SSL, which is this really nice library, which is super lightweight. Uh, it has uh, surprisingly uh, the, a lot of functionality, especially in terms of TLS, but uh, the, the parts which handle the verification and signing, that was, and the parts, first of all, parsing the X509 certificate. Uh, that was all working and it was fine for our use, so we decided to incorporate it in the loader. Uh, this library was uh, made by just uh, one guy who wanted to have something, uh, some kind of, uh, well, a very lightweight, lightweight library for embedded systems. And the uh, key advantage of Bear SSL is that it does not use dynamic allocation at all. This is also pretty modern, so it uses constant time uh, algorithms. So that's pretty cool. And uh, that's really what we did. We, we added the option, the compilation option, to include for SSL so that Loader can use it and the kernel. And uh, we are using it for, for, for very, very exit. The library uh, which we ended up making with, with uh, Simon from Juniper, that's called uh, libsecureboot. So you can find it in the libsecureboot. And it depends on Bird SSL. There's no alternative as of now. Um, if you don't want to use UEFI and certificates, uh, like Juniper, you can have embedded static keys, uh, as they were using. Uh, I think they, they were also using some PGP scheme for this. Uh, but I think uh, this uh, implementation of UEFI is really nice because you can use these as real things using DBX. Uh, you can use it from, you can do it from user space, you can do it directly in the BIOS, so it's really, really convenient and uh, quite simple in the implementation. All right, the next part, actually this was the, the key part in our project. So the project started when our customer wanted to have uh, a cert security uh, certification for their product. I forgot the actual name but it has had to involve a TPM. Uh, basically, they were doing a lot of IPsec with Strongsman, and the idea they had was to use the TPM uh, to sign the certificates for IP in the initial IPsec negotiation, so that the uh, private key is not stored on the system, but it's stored inside a dedicated separate hardware device. So similarly, if you are familiar with UV keys, uh, again, uh, you have a hardware security module where the private key is embedded in the, in the, the in this module, and it, uh, you just initiate signing requests to it, and it will sign things for you without ever disclosing the private key. 
And there are lots of other use cases as well. Uh, so very quickly uh, about how the PPM support looked look in FreeBSD. Um, there are different. There are two different uh, ver versions of the spec uh, of the trusted platform model spec. It's 1.2 and 2.0. These are the ones that are really used. Uh, the previous ones were deprecated and uh, not really recommended. So the TPM 1.2 driver was already in FreeBSD 8.2. However, we, need, we wanted to use TPM 2.0, and I will show you why. Uh, it's a good idea, and uh, you should all migrate to TPM 2.0 if you can. Uh, so we, we want to use WebPetroof 2.0. We made the driver uh, last year, and uh, both uh, low-level protocol modes, such as CRV and FIFO, are supported. However, uh, they're only supported for, for Intel systems as of now. Uh, if you're familiar with the LPC bus, that's the low pin count bus, it's something like uh, ISA, I think, and it's only available on Intel systems. I think it's on the South Bridge. Uh, and this is really the, the most common uh, TPM implementation. There are implementations using just the generic embedded I2C and SPI buses. Uh, so we have some ARM systems which are also working on, and they use TPMs. So they have to use the I2C, or there's also uh, uh, some you can buy just uh, uh, an adapter board which translates uh, these protocols. But, uh, the, the driver we made for FreeBSD currently only supports the LPC. There would have to be a separate driver for I2C and others. The particular TPM which we are using uh, was by Infineon, which I think is the most common vendor TPMs. It's 9665, and it's. Uh, I think it supports actually both 1.2 and 2.0. So some vendors, uh, they don't make you buy a new TPM if you want to switch on from 1.2 to 2.0. They just give you a different firmware for it because all it really, really is is a, I think there's a picture on the next slide. Uh, all it really is is a microcontroller, uh, some exotic architecture, something like 16 bit. And uh, you, can, you also have to update firmware on it. So that's something that people forget. There are vulnerabilities found in TPM firmware. Uh, Infineon had a few incidents, and uh, you should really make sure if you get one that uh, that you update this firmware. Uh, one thing uh, that was uh, the main sort of idea behind TPMs was that they were supposed to be cheap, like really cheap. So that uh, the idea was to have them included in all systems, even like small embedded systems, for happy cent counts. So uh, that was, I think, realized. Uh, if you look at the, the prices of TPMs, I was actually really surprised uh, how cheap they are. So if you're just buying one, uh, you can buy one from something from one dollar to five dollars. Uh, if you go on DigiKey or or Parnell or whatever, uh, they're they're up to one five dollars a piece. And uh, if you buy hundreds of them, I think the lowest you can get is 40 cents per chip. Uh, actually, for the whole board with uh, with uh, connectors and stuff. So it's really cheap, uh, and as a direct result of that, it's really slow. Uh, so do not treat it as a crypto accelerator because it's, uh, if anything, it's a decelerator. Uh, it's it's just super slow, but that's the trade of you're going there with. Uh, the idea is that it's simple and they can be integrated in all systems. I think uh, they're so versatile. If you look at the spec, they really follow everything almost. Uh, so, apart from this measure boot, which is maybe 90% of the use cases for the TPM, you can have secure storage. So, really complex authorization policies, which I'll explain later, uh, especially in the 2.0 version. You can generate keys on it, uh, just like an easy key. Uh, you can use it as a hardware random number generator, uh, which is something we also did for FreeBSD. So you can also use it as an RNG. Obviously, it will not uh, be the only source of entropy on your system. It just mixes in. We decided to just mix in the RNG, the, the entropy for, from the TPM into the general OS entropy pool. Uh, so it, it, I think it's disabled by default on AMD64, but uh, currently, if you're running that, you can uh, enable it for yourself if you want. 
I think it's uh, worth noting that this is really important for embedded systems where entropy is uh, hard to find, especially in the status of the book. So I think it's really, really crucial to uh, have a hardware-based source, at least you know, mixed in. Uh, otherwise, you, you might run into trouble if you're trying to generate keys early on to, to have a lot of determinism there and there have been attacks showing that uh, lots of embedded devices uh, fingable on the internet have, well, some of them have, have similar keys even though, even though they are not related due to this uh, determinism, lack of interrupts and such. Uh, okay, so one other thing that TPM can do, it can do general crypto. Uh, that can depending on the TPM. However, the private key operations are mandatory for TPMs. Uh, it, it mostly is opposed to RSA. Uh, in the newer one, you have ECC, elliptic curves. Uh, in some of them, you have a AES, so you can just uh, give it stuff to, to uh, encrypt symmetrically. It has to support SHA and HMAC, uh, which uh, is partly for encrypting the communication with the TPM. So this is actually possible to encrypt uh, and MAC communication from the CPU to the TPM, which is something not a lot of people know. Not a lot of people know that there's an option that Microsoft didn't know. And for BitLocker, they, they, for BitLocker they're using TPMs, but they're not uh, using this encryption. So you can just sniff on the bus, which is easy because it's slow. Uh, but yeah, uh, if you look at the spec, there's really quite a lot of options. And uh, they're mostly known for the measure boot, however, there's much more th things you can use it for. In a few slides, I'll show you, show you the use cases which we found the most compelling. Uh, very quickly, the differences between the versions. This is important uh, in that most software is supported uh, supporting the 1.2 because it uh, uh, was made like 10 years ago. So most of the software supports 1.2. Not all software and even libraries, not all options of the 2.0 are supported. Uh, so you have to watch out for that. Uh, however, it's, it's getting better. The reason why you should really not be using 1.2 is uh, it was overall a pretty good spec, even though it was really hard to read, and maybe that's why people were put off. Uh, it, it was pretty complex. But the, the, I think the biggest downside of 1.2 is, is that it has hard-coded algorithms in the spec. and. Uh, the idea they had is to hard code SHA-1 as the reference hashing. This is obviously you know, good for, for today's times. Maybe it wasn't good 10 years ago. So, uh, and there's no way to, to circumvent, circumvent that. It's in the spec. Uh, and also, there's no elliptic curves. Uh, RSA2K is the only one. Uh, AES encryption is optional. So uh, in 2.0, they fixed that by introducing algorithm ability. So there's not one specific algorithm that's uh, burned in in the spec. There's only like a maximum key and hash length to uh, define. In practice, you have SHA-256, SHA-512, you have RSA up to 4K, you have elliptic curves, and very often you have AES, uh, at least one of the three eight. So uh, that's 2.0. Uh, I'll be talking in a few slides about the authorization rules, which you can use for objects stored in the TPM. Uh, I think it's uh, really flexible. Important to note, they're not backwards compatible. They're, they're very different in these specs. Uh, so you saw this two slides ago, uh, the, uh, how the TPM usually looks when you buy it. It can be pluggable, can be like, soldered on the board. I was thinking that if you get a pluggable one, you might be susceptible to an evil made attack when somebody does has a sniffer which matches the pins and just in five seconds, you can swap in the sniffer in and sniff all the communication. That's why it's useful to put this cross encryption. And it's soldered. It would take more than a coffee break to implement the sniffer. Uh, however, it doesn't have to be this discrete uh, device. The TPM doesn't say much about the physical implementation, really. It's up to the vendor. So you might as well have a firmware TPM. And this is actually, in terms of the deployment, the, uh, the, the most deployed one because if you check your BIOS, very often you will see something said that something called FTPM, and uh, this is now supported both on uh, Intel systems and AMD systems. Uh, Intel does it in Intel ME, whether you like it or not. 
uh, A and B has a, something that's uh, pretty equivalent to the LME, which is PSP, and it also has an FTPM in it. We discovered that it's kind of a maybe a butchered version of the TPM, so it doesn't support a lot of things, but the upside of using the firmware TPM is you don't have these performance issues because it really runs on your CPU. Maybe in a privileged mode, like uh, we work a lot on ARM systems at semi half. Uh, they use Plot Zone, which is this secure world kind of hardware based isolation for memory and for devices and for code. So you can uh, put the entire TPM software in Plot Zone and make secure calls into Plot Zone, and it's uh, almost as good as a separate discrete device. Although you might argue that we have these side channel attacks these days and it uh, runs on the same CPU, it might be. The, the keys might still leak, so maybe that's another argument to use those discrete uh, TPMs even though they are slow. So some interesting use cases. Uh, of course, they are uh, quite adored in the enterprise because uh, yeah, you can use them for disk encryption. Uh, you can do remote attestation. Uh, so uh, it's similar to how it's done in SGX conclave. So basically, the, the TPM with the method boot part, it uh, proves a certain platform state. I'll be explaining what it really means. Uh, but uh, it can prove to remote, remote agent, remote server, that a system has a specific platform state. And if the server uh, knows that this state is trusted, then we can continue communication and perhaps uh, provision some keys or do whatever. So in essence, the TPM stores the platform state in terms of cryptographic hashes of different images that, that were executed during boot. And uh, for remote attestation, there's an option for the TPM to sign this, uh, along with uh, a nonce to prevent replays. So uh, this, this is very useful for enterprise. Uh, however, it's not so widely deployed, I think. Mm, another thing you can use the TPM with is like uh, similarly to a YubiKey, you can use it as a smart card like TPG. You can sign uh, messages with the key which is embedded with the TPM. So the private key never leaves the TPM. You have to put it in there and in the initialization stage, but after that, it, it never leaves the TPM. Only signs what, what you want it to. Are we talking about IPsec DPM? How we can how we can do the same thing with, with IPsec? Uh, a, a very common use, use case these days, especially since BitLocker from Microsoft uh, supported it, was just storing your disk encryption keys in there. So tying it uh, to the TPM. Uh, Linux LUKS, LUKS also supports it. Uh, unfortunately, FreeBSD GUI does not support it yet. We'd like to keep it, have that happen. However, our customer was not using, uh, using this, I think. So. Uh, we didn't do the work on that. A uh, really important advantage of uh, using this TPM, uh, uh, apart from, from other uh, other kind of uh, uh, security solutions, that it, it supports anti-hammering. So, if you're just trying to brute force the, your, your password to the brute or pin to the disk encryption key or any other thing that's in TPM, that's a hardware enforced. Uh, anti-hammering scheme, which where you fail a few times, it will just enter a lockdown. And uh, either you have to wait a long time for it to reset, or you need to supply something which is called the, uh, I think the owner, yeah, the owner password. This is something which you set up when you provision the TPM. So you buy the TPM, you have to set it up with an owner password, and uh, you're not supposed to use it much, you're supposed to store it somewhere safe. And this is what will get you out of lockdown. So it, it prevents brute forcing and dictionary attacks. Uh, as I mentioned on one of the first, li first slides, you can store the trusted root keys with certificates in the TPM. There's not much space for it. Uh, most TPMs, like Nantinia, which I showed you, showed you uh, I think it has something like 10K memory, 10K NVRAM. That's 10, 10 kilobytes. That's not a lot, but uh, yeah, what you want to do. These are cheap. Uh, and RNG for the OS, uh, which we, we 
did in the TPM 2.0 project. Uh, so I was talking about the NVRAM. You can put your keys in the NVRAM or any kind of data really. And it will be the, the separate object. And for each separate object in the NVRAM, you can implement a very complex authorization policy. So it's not only required that your TPM is in your computer. Uh, for, for each object, you can define different rules for accessing. So if these rules are not met, the TPM will just, will just not give you the key or the, the object. It will just refuse. Uh, and these can be combined with and and or in the, in the 2.0 spec. So they can be really complex. Uh, the, the options which you have, I think there's more than just, just these, but of course you can have a password. So you just send the password to your TPM uh, as means of authorization. You can have a pin code. You can have HMAC, you can have pre-shared symmetric key, uh, both for the TPM and the system. Uh, a very important one is the PCR state. So this is this representation of the platform and boot integrity. So if the PCR state uh, uh, is different than the, the trusted one, which is uh, remembered by the TPM, it will not disclose the keys as well. This is what is used very often for disk encryption. Like BitLocker uses it uh, in the, the simplest state. Uh, so if there's any uh, malicious software and any modification in the firmware, or there could be also, uh, you could also include in this PCR state uh, some fluctuation, like you defy environmental variables. So if any part changes, the TPM will notice and it will not give the keys. Physical presence is another one. Uh, can be just a separate pin on the chip which you connect to something like the bottom. Or maybe it could mean just some bias access depending on the implementation. Like direct access to the bias menu. You have counters, you have time limits, uh, lots of other things for those. So uh, you can configure it as you like. Uh, some problems with the TPMs, uh, quite a lot of them, but I think still they're, they're pretty useful. Uh, initially, there were some concerns with anonymity in terms of this remote attestation. So in, in any remote attestation scheme, you have to take care of anonymi anonym anonymity. Otherwise, the remote uh, server might identify you personally, uh, like identify your machine, and you might not want that. So uh, in 1.2, they introduced something called DAA, uh, I mean direct anonymous attestation, which is something like a zero knowledge proof, uh, which only tells you that during remote attestation that you're part of a group. It does not identify you directly. Uh, there were some DRM concerns uh, 10 years ago or so when these were introduced. And they could be used for DRM and uh, locking down your platform and uh, uh, stopping you from being the owner of your platform and deciding for you what kind of software you can, you can run. I think uh, for, for like generic media DRM, uh, TPMs are a really bad idea to, to, to use it with DRM, DRM, especially since Intel ME and FGX came out, especially Intel ME, where uh, you have actually DRM running on Intel it with Intel ME, like Netflix and others, and it's just much better suited for DRM. So I think this concern is invalid these days, and in fact, I haven't heard of any DRM implementation uh, involving TPMs. I said that these are slow, the discrete ones. You can use the firmware TPM if you want, if you trust Intel ME. So you can trust it in the, either Intel or Infineon, uh, your choice. Uh, something which kind of was really annoying in the, in the first stages where we got our TPM and we just thought that the, the, these are standardized. So uh, you, you might notice that in recent motherboards, I think this has been the case for years, uh, Pretty much each motherboard these days has a TPM header. So we thought that these are standardized, but in fact they are not. Uh, we saw at least three different versions of the headers. Uh, so there was not just different pin count, but there was also a different pin pitch. And I think, I think the third or fourth, the or fourth uh, motherboard which we found was uh, uh, good to accommodate the TPM which we got. So when you're buying a TPM, make sure double check or triple check if it will fit in your motherboard. 
the specification is uh, pretty complex and hard to read, even just to point out. Uh, it's pretty huge. It also involves uh, like a software layer with lots of terminology. So I think this was one of the reasons why they did not have such great adoption as, as they could have had. Uh, we also ran into some problems with available software for it. So for 2.0, not all options were supported by some common libraries. Uh, in, in particular, the bus encryption. Uh, for example, we are using the IBM TSS software library for communication with the TCM. It did not support bus encryption and some other algorithms. Uh, so let's hope the state will get better. Um, the fact that this bus encryption is, is just optional means that, and sometimes lacking support in libraries, means that in most cases I've seen uh, it, it is not used. So, so actually we might say that the TPM spec, the TPM threat model, physical uh, attacks are sort of out of scope. But if you have the bus encryption, then it's really hard to implant a sniffer uh, because it's all encrypted. Another thing is that uh, I'll be talking about PCRs, maybe it will make sense uh, in a bit, but uh, you have to make sure that you cannot reset these PCRs. Uh, otherwise, you uh, can uh, kill the security of the measure. Uh, I've also said that we need to update the firmware, and probably a lot of people remember that. Uh, okay, so uh, measure code. This is something which is, the, I would say, the, the biggest. Uh, use case for the TPM. And I've talked about secure bit before. Uh, this is different. It's not really related, but it has similar similar purposes. So I'll tell you how it differs. Uh, the measure boot is strictly involving the TPM. Uh, and this uh, platform state or machine state is represented by the registers which are called PCR. These are the registers in, in TPM. There are something like 20 of them. They're called platform configuration registers. And they just contain cryptographic hashes, like SHA-256 or SHA-512. And uh, the idea is that uh, they can be extended. So you cannot directly replace the PCR. You can't just put a value in the PCR. There's no, no operation like that. You can only uh, do something which is called extending. And uh, you can see the, the equation for the extending. So you have this some specific value in the PCR. Uh, you can read it. Uh, the TPM will, will show it to you. But if you want to extend this PCR with some new hash or new new values, you supply it. And the operation which is done is concatenation of the old one and the, the data to extend. Then the whole thing is hashed. And the result is stored in this PCR uh, by the TPM. So this is done by the TPM, not by itself. The idea is that these are cryptographic hashes, so one-way functions, and you cannot reverse this process. If you have like, the first state folder, next state folder, and you have UFI, you know, loader, at each stage, uh, the first, the, the specific image hashes the next one to be loaded before loading it, and puts this hash in the PCR, right? recording the state. And then the next one does the same, the next one does the same, but it's uh, being stored in the same PCR. So you cannot reverse this process, and the sequence also matters in this, uh, in this, uh, in this way. So uh, again, very similar uh, purpose as in the case of secure boot. Uh, it's just very important that you cannot uh, reset uh, the PCR. So usually the PCRs are reset to zero if the machine itself is reset by ACPI. Uh, so if the, if the PCRs are not reset, if you're like at the second stage of those, let's say, and the, the attacker takes execution, uh, they will not be able to uh, make it so that there's a specific hashes in this PCR. You cannot replace it. So it can uh, extend anything, but they will not be able to extend it in such a way that the result will be what they want to be. So it will make sense to, well, when I tell you how you can use these PCRs for locking different objects. Uh, yeah, so as I said, you're doing measurements when you're booting. 
for each uh, piece of firmware and also things like configuration, environmental variables, and so on. And uh, the idea is that it's not, uh, the difference between secure business and this and is that this is just measuring, this is passive. You're measuring, you're putting the hashes in the DPM, and you're, you're, you're continuing, so you're not preventing further execution. So then you have, when you get, by the time you get to DOS, uh, when you're in DOS, the PCRs are there in the TPM, you can read it, and uh, you can decide whether you're trusting the state or not. So you have maybe, you remember what is the good value of the PCR. If it's incorrect, you uh, uh, maybe stop execution, or uh, it can be implemented uh, as you wish. Uh, it's just an information that the system is not trusted. You can do what you want with, what you want with it, but you get up to the OS. There will be no enforcement. So if you if you have a an object in the TPM like a like a key for encryption uh, or any kind of secret, you can lock it to a specific state of the PCRs. Uh, there are different PC PCRs, so you can select which ones will be valid or not. And if you lock it to a specific the state of PCRs, the TPM will only disclose this object if the PCRs match. Uh, so. Again, if there's any uh, change in, the, in, the, in any of the images uh, previously, the headers will be completely different, and the attacker will not be able to reverse and supply their own hash, unless they are able to reset and go from zero. Uh, so this is problematic uh, in, in, that, in that sense that uh, if you have this object and you uh, see it with the particular state of PCRs in the TPM, and you update any of the firmware, any part, then you will have to, you will lose access to this object, right? Because the PCRs will be different. Your platform state is different, and the TPM will not give you the key. So before you do any update, you have to uh, unseal it, uh, set a different PCR for the new state of the platform, and seal it again. That's quite problematic, so it's really important to select the PCRs which you are using uh, correctly for a particular use case. So. You're not uh, maybe you're not including the PCRs uh, that are frequently changing. So that's that's the, the tricky part. Uh, again, this is how a measure with flow uh, looks like. So we have up to 20 PCRs. Usually, the lower ones are from the software that was executed earlier. So the root trust for measurement, uh, the first software that runs. Hashes the next day firmware to set in the PCR. Uh, well, just extend it and extends this PCR, and the uh, firmware does the same with the bootloader, and then you end up with some kind of hash. Basically, it's rolling hash in the PCRs. And you can also, uh, it's not just for, for booting, you can also, when you're in the US, you can have some kind of configuration and uh, also lock, lock secrets to that or whatever. So it's uh, quite flexible. Among these pieces, uh, apart from these PCR measurements, there's also an event log which is created, especially, I think it only concerns the UAFI. So it's just a list of uh, objects which were hashed and stored in some common location, and it also has data events for each object. So later on, when you're in the OS, you can read this event log, uh, read the PCRs from the DPM, and uh, replay all these extend operations like in software, based on this equation which I showed you earlier, and uh, you confirm uh, whether it's authentic or not, whether it did uh, match or not. Again, the TPM can sign those PCR values uh, with some nonce requested by a remote uh, requester, so the remote site can, uh, can be assured that the platform state is uh, such and such. The T TPM obviously is signed itself, so cannot be spoofed. Uh, so, we uh, were thinking about whether we want any other features uh, that the ones that are already working with UEFI in the loader. And we are quite satisfied with how it works now. So, UEFI measures every binary which it runs. And the loader.efi is an EFI binary, so it will be included in the measurement. And uh, it did so, it already works out of the box. However, PBSD itself cannot extend PCRs, so there's no support for that. 
And uh, something something uh, can be done to improve the scheme is the, the loader could also measure the kernel and modules, but then uh, if you update the kernel often, then everything you're locking with the PCRs will have to be uh, unsealed and sealed. Okay, so uh, now on to the IP side part. Uh, StrongSwan is an open source uh, IP set implementation uh, which our customer was using. And uh, when the tunnels are established, uh, the Internet Key Exchange protocol is used for, the, for uh, initial authorization. So you can use either featured, key, featured keys, uh, which are available on both sides, like in TLS, or you can use certificates. And we were uh, using certificates. Uh, so we need, we need to be able to sign uh, these certificates. Uh, and traditionally, we had like a private key in the file uh, on disk, and it could leak. So and it could be in memory as well. So the idea is to use TPM so it uh, has this embedded private key, which is never exposed to software or the CPU, and it will sign these certificates for us like that. So if you are signing a request, the TPM signs it, and it just sends you the the result without showing you the key. What you need to use that is this uh, TPM driver we created, uh, the software with the library layer uh, called IBM PSS. There's also an Intel one, there's basically two versions. The Intel one is the most functional, has uh, the biggest support, but it was difficult to run it on PBSD because it had some dependencies. So uh, we, we went with IBM PSS, which is open source, you can download it on soft source, source board. And it does all the talking, does all the protocol handling uh, for the TPM. Uh, I think that's the one line I would need to make it built properly on PBSD. For the Intel one, it was much more complicated. And however, it's not yet, not yet been, been merged in the, the repository. Um, also, StrongSign needs some modification uh, because it was primarily used for with the Intel, Intel the TSS. So uh, we have a pull request on Strongsun to uh, so that it works with IBM. That's how we can use the PBSD. Uh, so yeah, I have, I've talked about how the TPM signs the certificates. We can also use a path trace as an additional layer of protection. So it's either stored in clear text, which is maybe not ideal in the Strongsun configuration, or it can be prompted for. Uh, bear in mind that this is, of course, much slower if you're using the discrete implementation of the TPM. Uh, it takes something like 0.15 seconds to sign with an RSA 2K key, which, uh, if you're uh, establishing a lot of tunnels per second, might be a problem. You might want to use the firmware one then, or, uh, or some other technology. This is how it, how it looks in the strong sign configuration file. Uh, or Swan CTL, it's called. Uh, basically, TPM objects are identified by these handles. So, uh, if you want to configure a strong Swan to use uh, the TPM, and by the way, the plugin for the TPM is already there in Strong Swan. You didn't have to write it, so the support was already there. We put the handle which you're going to use uh, for a specific uh, tunnel, and you put in uh, an optional password uh, if you want to use it or not. And this way, uh, yeah, uh, your your key will not uh, will not be ever available to strong sun or any any uh, any part of the yeah, of your system. And uh, I think that's uh, that's about it. Uh, there are lots of other uses for TPMs, but I would say that this configuration, uh, PCR state, uh, memory boot are the and uh, things like signing things uh, for GPG or for, for IPsec, these are the most common ones. So I think there's almost no uh, no reason not to use one, because they're just so cheap and so useful. Uh, so yeah, that's pretty much what I had to say. There's a lot, a lot more you can do with TPMs. So there's some more stuff in the paper, which we, we put out, we wrote the white paper for this uh, for this project and for this presentation. So uh, I'll put, put it up in the, on the website of the conference. Some acknowledgments, uh, Stormfield was, uh, were the initiators of the project and the sponsor of the, the entire research which we did, the entire work. 
Uh, also, thanks to Simon and Jennifer uh, for fruitful cooperation about uh, uh, common integration of very active and our our patches into uh, the result being the Lip Secure Library. Uh, so yeah, all of this is available in head, and you can use it uh, if you have any questions. Please ask us. We are also update uh, man pages if there's any need. Um, so we can use either the TPM as an RNG, TPM uh, just in general, very exec if you want it uh, as an option, and uh, all the other things I talked about. So yeah, that's about it. Uh, if you have any questions. Um, sorry, I'm sorry. Um, Hi. So the, the load it currently keeps is pseudo TPR, so the provision of the patches. Unfortunately, right now it's everything other hashes, and an Aaron implementation, I believe, the order in which it ends up reading the load on the files is not the same. But um, I'm thinking of tweaking it so that it only updates that pseudo PCR for the modules kernel and the things that have to be hashed. They end up being read in a much more deterministic order. So you've got a step change. So that, that ends up being exported to uh, the kernel. Yeah, so as I said, up to this point, we were just, uh, so far we were, we were happy with uh, extending the PCRs to before the kernel. So uh, CVFI does it with the loader, and we didn't want to extend it further. But yeah, what you're saying would be an improvement. Any other questions? Yes? Actually, we have two questions. One is the PCRs are used to store the results of the measured group process. Um, but you also said that the PCRs are only shared by hardware reset. Is that, when you say hardware reset, you're referring to like remove power, reapply power, or reset as in some cleared contents of the TPM operation? So usually the, on the platform, uh, I think that TPM reset, which you have to do in order to clear the PCRs, is uh, combined with the is ACPI reset of the entire machine. So okay. there, there shouldn't be, uh, this is actually, uh, there was an attack. I linked to it in the white paper where somebody found a way to only reset the TPM, like trick the TPM into thinking the whole machine is being reset. And then the attacker can just when the values are zero, they can supply their own hashes. Okay. So, so that, that breaks security. So that, that hardware reset is a normal frequent. Yes. The other question is that the PCRs, uh, well, there's a limited number of PCRs, obviously. And as I mentioned, until about zero, you have to be very careful about which PCR you decide to use. Yeah, you can use all of them, or you can supply a bit mask of which PCRs uh, you want to use for locking a specific object. So, one object can be locked to a PCR 0, 1, 2, 3, or also 7, and the other yeah. object with different ones. But we have boot environments now where all the pieces of code executing during the measured boot process aren't, aren't written by the same person, much less even the same organization. Yeah. How do you coordinate who gets to use which PCR? Yes, I, I didn't mention that, but it's actually kind of standardized in the, by the TPM spec. Uh, I didn't uh, put it up on the, on the slide, but uh, yeah. it's kind of standardized in terms of these, these, this bootloader, it's in this PCR, and these are just for custom use by the US, and so on and so forth. So it's, it is standardized. Okay, so if I'm writing an operating system bootloader, there's a set that are basically reserved for yes. me to. Okay, that's right. Thank you. Yes? Uh, I had a question about the anti armoring. Uh, you said that uh, to unlock when it, it goes to the down, you have to, to provide the owner password? Yes, now. this is this password which is, which is uh, not used for, for most of the operations. It is the first thing which is set up when you provision the TPM. But could you, could you just start to cover that password instead of the... The, the idea is that the owner password is long and complex and it's uh, stored separately, separately. That's the idea. Uh, by the way, a fun fact, uh, when Microsoft takes uh, find the TPM, like when Windows find the TPM, uh, it starts to provision it, they can take ownership of it, that's what it's called. Uh, it sets up this owner's for owner password, I think it generates a random string, it sets it up with the TPM, and then forgets it, never gives it to you. Uh, I guess they didn't want people to just write it down on a piece of paper or something. 
that uh, normally when you're using the TPM on your own for your own purposes, you're supposed to take this owner password, the phone one, store it somewhere safe, never use it again, only when you enter lockdown or if there was some other situation where you need the owner password. But normally you don't use this password for anything else. I think again, uh, when you're supplying the password, uh, there's a separate mechanism, anti-hammering mechanism, but I, I don't, don't remember exactly. Are there take ownership tools in for VSD for 2.0? So you're using the uh, IBM TSS, which has a toolkit for all the operations, pretty okay. much all the operations, the TPM. So the take ownership, that's another, that's one of the calls to the TPM, which we're using the TSS for. That's how we're using it with the IBM TSS. Okay. Okay, if there are no other questions, thank you, thank you all for coming.